As a kid, I was obsessed with getting out of Alabama. When people asked me where I was from, I would say nowhere because that's pretty much what it felt like. Rural, backwards, boring, Alabama. Of all the places in the world for a storyteller to be born. When we were kids, my brother and I, we used to sit outside in our yard and we used to fantasize about what it would be like to have sidewalks. All the kids in the commercials had them. If we had sidewalks, we could bike, we could skate, I could finally learn double dutch. We could play hopscotch. Sidewalks meant freedom, neighborhood. A neighborhood meant neighbors. We couldn't imagine what it would be like to have neighbors. This obsession with getting out of Alabama eventually morphed into this passion for travel. At a young age, I realized I could write to travel agents and tour companies and request travel itineraries. So within a matter of weeks, I had a pile of travel books and itineraries. And I would sit in my room and pour over these books, 10 day trip through the Amazon rainforest, an adventure in the Monte Verde cloud forest. I would read these books and I would just wish myself anywhere else. And where was I? I grew up on my granddad's farm. My granddad owns 688 acres of central Alabama. If you stand in the front yard and you turn around 360 degrees, everything that you see for as far as you can see belongs to this 92-year-old black man. On this farm, there are horses, there are cows, there are goats, there are hunting dogs, there's a rooster. He has two lakes. And in those lakes, he has catfish, he has brim, bass. In his field, he grows watermelons, collard greens, black eyed peas, okra, sweet potatoes. Anything that you can think of, he's probably grown it. He's farmed this soil his entire life. He and my grandmom raised 14 kids here. To say that my granddad is a character is a bit of an understatement. He can tell just by looking at a crop what it needs. He can tell which calves belong to which cows based solely on their colors. He can look at the water in the lake and tell you what the fish are missing. He reads the Bible and the farmer's almanac religiously. And right now he gets around with a walker, but he still rides the four-wheeler. He just straps a cane onto the front so that when he's done zipping around, he can actually walk. He never finished elementary school because he had to quit to go work in the fields. And yet he has this knowledge that eludes most of us. According to family lore, this farm came to us because one of our ancestors, a white slave owner, had a son with another of our ancestors, an enslaved black woman who worked as his cook. Before he died, the slave owner made sure that he discreetly passed along a small parcel of land to his son. That land is at the heart of what is now my granddad's farm. The bell that stands in my granddad's yard is the original bell that was used to call the slaves in from the fields. On this farm, the young and old gather to tell and retell stories that range in setting from backwoods juke joints to white wooden churches from winding dirt roads to crowded city tenements. These serve to not only keep us connected, but to ingrain our unique history in our bones. If you told me years ago that this farm, these people, would be central to my work as an artist, I would have adamant, adamantly <laughs> denied it. Back then, the dirt that I grew up in was just a disappointment. For years, I traveled the globe chasing stories. Namibia, Botswana, Iceland, South Africa. I took workshops hoping that I could learn to be a good storyteller. Cape Town, Lisbon, Reykjavik. The world was mine for the taking and it was exhilarating. 
So what could Alabama possibly have to teach me about life, about storytelling? More than I knew. You see, sometimes the best stories are closer than we think. In 2007, after years of traveling the globe, I was forced to return to Alabama. I'd just gone through this terrible breakup. I was newly single, and I was also a single parent for the first time. And I was depressed, I was upset, I was angry, I was wounded. I felt like having to return to this place meant that I had failed somehow in life. I hadn't been able to, to cut it. But something really interesting happened. I found solace on my granddad's farm. I took up fishing. <laughs> I took up fishing. <laughs> I would stand around the lake and fish for hours and just listen to the sounds of nature. I dedicated entire days to sitting on my granddad's porch. And most days nothing happened, you know, I just, I was very patient. But eventually, the stories came. My uncles would come out of the woods from their hunts and they would brag about what they'd killed. They would give each other a hard time. They would reenact scenes from the hunt. My granddad would come out and he would dole out the day's duties, go mend the fence, find a lost cow, run to the co-op and pick up some supplies, go see a man about a bull, go take some okra to one of the widows from church. Amidst all of this, my aunts, uncles, cousins, would come and go and they would tell all of these remarkable stories. And the thing that's funny about this is I knew most of these stories by heart. I grew up hearing them. I grew up with this way of collective storytelling. But because I'd been away for so long, I could see the South with new eyes. The way that black Southerners told stories, it was like a fingerprint. It was distinctive. It was unique. There was a rhythm and a cadence that I didn't hear in Philadelphia. I didn't hear in Boston. So what I decided to do was stop writing my great American novel that I'd been working on for years, which was ironically set somewhere in Namibia. So I put that aside, and I picked up my camera, and I just decided to follow my granddad around his farm. So I followed him around. I took notes. I wrote down his quotes. I wrote down things he said about the land, about the seasons, about the farm, about our family. And days turned to months, months turned to years. And before I knew it, this project emerged that I now call it Alabama Land. But it is the center now of my work as an artist. It's my, my passion. I started sending out these photographs to different editors and different journals. And so many people were invested in this story and in publishing these photographs that it was surprising to me. So, what could Alabama possibly have to teach me about storytelling, about life? Everything. Everything I learned about how to be a good storyteller, I learned on my grandfather's porch. My family is massive. Like, I can't even tell you the names of all my first cousins. I don't know who they are. I see them. I know their faces. And hundreds and hundreds of people come to our family reunions. We have them on my granddad's farm. So it's a very serious affair. You know, we have food, everything. And at any given time, there are like 15 different stories going on. But when my grandfather speaks in his low, low voice, everyone stops what they're doing to listen. The room hushes itself. And people lean in because they want to hear what he has to say. They know that there's a wisdom and a knowledge and an experience experience to his words that we don't have. I wish that I had the time to share with you all the lessons that I learned on my granddad's farm, but I don't. So I want to share with you four lessons that I learned that have sort of resonated for me in my life and in my work. The first, commitment, persistence, and resilience are key. So I'm going to give you a little history lesson here. Most people don't know this, but when schools integrated in the South, a lot of black families 
didn't allow their children to integrate. Most of them were afraid of what would happen to their kids. They knew it would be really rough, but they also were afraid of what the white community would do to them. A lot of families were blacklisted for allowing their kids to integrate, so they couldn't sell their goods in town. My granddad, however, was different. He's very stubborn. And so when integration happened, he basically gave his kids two choices. They could either drop out of school and work on the farm and take up this life of farming, or they could integrate. Now, the one condition to them integrating was that if they started, once they did that and made that decision, no matter what happened, no matter what anyone did to him or to them, they could not quit. For him, quitting would be a win for the bigots. Quitting meant that it would be that much harder for all of the people that followed them. All of my aunts and my uncles and my mom chose to integrate. And they joke now that they did that because they grew up working on the farm and they knew how hard it was, so they chose the bigots over the farm. <laughs> so today, they all have college degrees. Many of them have multiple degrees. They are foreign advisors, they're nurses, they're teachers, they are ministers, all because they would not quit. The second lesson, you can't save everyone or everything. So one day I'm sitting with my granddad, and he asked me about what happened with my relationship. And I'm like, oh no, I knew this was coming. I've been dreading it this whole time. And so I tell him. And I'm half expecting that he's going to reprimand me because he's very old fashioned in some ways. So he takes a deep breath and he says, well, you know, I learned a long time ago, if a man is drowning and you know you're not strong enough to save him, don't swim in and let him drown you. And he went on to tell this story about how when he was young, he tried to rescue a cousin who was drowning, but he wasn't a good swimmer. And they both almost died because his cousin panicked and was trying to take him down. But I've used this lesson and applied it to my professional life, my personal life, everything. Because sometimes you have to know your own limitations. And you have to be able to look at a situation and know that it's going to be detrimental to what you want for yourself. The third lesson, draw them in with a good teaser. So one day we're sitting on my granddad's porch and we're all talking, we're loud, having a good time, telling our stories. And my aunt, out of nowhere, yells, a man got slapped in his coffin in Reform, Alabama. And then she sits back. <laughs> and everyone on the porch just hushed. You know, and I turned to her and I remember saying, I have to hear this story. And then she said again, I'm just telling you, this man, he lived a, a horrible life. This woman stormed into his funeral and slapped him in his coffin. That's just the kind of life he lived. And she went on to tell the story, but I will never forget how that one line got all of our attention. Fourth story. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So I keep talking about how storytelling in Alabama is this collective endeavor. And to, to me, it's such an art form. Like there is this rhythm and cadence and there's call and response. And you, know, you have people egging you on. And to me, it's kind of like a dance. And because I'm a child of the 80s, I think about it kind of like break dancing, which is weird to think of in terms of my granddad. But anyway, like in break dancing, you have this circle of people, right? And they're all kind of supportive of you. And you have one person in the, in the center. And that person starts the rhythm, starts the beat, starts the cadence, sets the tone. They do their thing, you know? And then when they feel like they've reached this plateau and the story needs to go someone else, somewhere else, they tag the next person, that person comes in, they do something a little different, they take the story to a new place, but it's still the same rhythm and the same cadence and the same beat, and then the third person, and then the fourth person. And this is exactly how we tell stories on the porch in the South. And because of this collective nature of storytelling, we all feel like we have a sense of, of ownership of these stories. They're all of ours. They belong to all of us, and because of that, we make sure that the stories are passed on to the next generation and the next generation. In 2012, three of my photographs were published in this magazine. 
It's a Harvard magazine. And for me, this was a huge accomplishment because this was one of my favorite publications. It's like that one publication you want to see your work in, and it finally happened. So I'm, I'm over the moon. Like, I used to sit here in Berlin Library and fantasize about being published in this magazine. It's called Transition. So of course, I'm very proud. I'm excited. Two of the photographs that they published were of my grandfather. And in one of the photographs, my grandfather is sitting on the porch, and there's a cowboy standing over him, and they're shaking hands. Now, my grandfather is sitting because he can't get up and get down so quickly, so, um, and the cowboy is standing over him. And the thing that's interesting is this cowboy is stereotypical <laughs> southern, backwoods, sort of rednecky cowboy. He's got his hat, he's got the big cowboy belt buckle, the boots. And in that moment, they shook hands, and I remember they talked for like two minutes, but the whole time they just held hands while they were talking. So it was a very tender moment between these two people from two very different worlds. The second photo is um, this photo of my granddad sitting on the porch. And I love it because from the perspective, you can't tell if he's sad, if he's happy, if he's awake, if he's reading, like what he's doing. But to me, the porch is his place. It's where he's most himself. So I take these photos to my granddad, and I'm, I'm very excited. I'm like, you're in a Harvard magazine. Actually, I thought it was more like Harvard. You are in a Harvard magazine. And I show it to him, and I'm so excited. So he opens the book. And he leans it towards the window the way he does when he needs more light. And he looks at one photo, he looks at the other photo, and then he hands it back to me. He doesn't say anything. And so I'm like, what do you think? What do you think? You know, it's Harvard, it's Harvard. And he just says, well, I just don't understand why anyone would care to read about me in a book. I'm a simple man. I just worked hard my entire life and tried to do what's right. And I just said, Granddad, more people want to hear your story than you know, more than you could ever imagine. Thank you.